This is the Outlap F1 Podcast featuring America's own Cody, Andy, and Deanna. Your one-stop shop for Formula One news, insights, race previews, and reviews. Join us on the Outlap. How we doing, Outlap F1 Nation? This is season six. This is episode number 11 of the Outlap F1 podcast. It's our 2024 Chinese Grand Prix. We finally made it back to China. Uh, Grand Prix race preview show. Uh, you've got Andy, and I'm along with my wonderful, normal preview co-host tonight, Mr. Cody. Uh, we're we're dobbing the the same merch on the on our heads, but you have a very interesting shirt on. Uh, but how you, how you doing? And ex- explain that thing just a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'm doing really well. And this shirt came from uh, the deep recesses of my dad's closet. Uh, ended up having a need for a shirt after an oil change, and he's like, "Oh, I happen to have this weird bowling shirt that I've never worn." It has uh, pretty much like an indie car on it, so I thought uh, I'd give it a shot. It kind of matches the hat a little bit, anyway. So I was going to um, say you 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 look like you're ready to go bowl a 300 game, you know, on behalf of Team Us. So maybe that maybe we'll don yeah. that. Maybe that'll be our next logo. You know, just hang on to that thing. Yeah. Team Team Outlap for bowling. I guarantee it would not be a 300 point. Game oh no! I my god. Um, I I think. <laughs> Once every three years, I'll bowl like 150, and like, but then I can never repeat it. So you get one where like <laughs> I, it'll magically line up. I'll start hitting things, and, but then it goes away, and then all the rest of the time it's it's an unmitigated disaster. And if I break a hundred, I'm like doing a mental backflip. But uh, anyway, <laughs> you're not here to learn about my bike crappy bowling game. Um, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, you're here. We're here to talk about some F1. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, so you can find our show as always Twitter X, whatever that platform is, whatever's left of it. It's to this point, Instagram, Discord, Reddit, and of course, YouTube uh, at Outlap F1 podcast is the handle. You can see our link tree for all the ways to get our show, including our new Apple podcast thread. Uh, so all our epi- all our latest episodes are on the new thread. Uh, so you just uh, like and follow the show like you did before, and uh, you'll get all our latest stuff there. Uh, but if you're on your other favorite podcasting apps, they all still work the same way that they used to. YouTube obviously still posts uh, like it always has as well. So out at Outlap F1 Podcast, the handle for all of that. If you're on YouTube and you like what you're seeing, you know, enjoy what you're hearing. You can click the five star button, uh, or like and subscribe on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting app. You can click the five star button. Uh, again, it just helps us to come up a little bit better in search results. Helps us get our content to you a little bit quicker, if you are so inclined. Email the show chat now at outlapf one dot com. The website. I'm going to put that away for a little bit until we actually figure out the nuts and bolts of that. I am not a web programmer. <laughs> it's taken me a little bit longer. <laughs> Every time I open it up, it keeps telling me I'm doing something wrong and I don't know what. So uh, we'll just leave that there. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much to the Outlap F1 Nation for continuing to step up. Uh, thank you so much to our continued monetary supporters, including Dean Warwick, Yuri Dolchester, Paul Weaver, Quentin Warden, Kevin Kelly, Regan Stanzik, Timothy Brown, and of course, Jonathan Scott. If you'd like to become a member of what we call the Outlap F1 Nation, you can see our link tree in our show notes. It's our anchor page, a dollar, five dollars. All goes into making the show better. Uh, might just pay for me to take a web development class at some point. Um, but whatever, uh, that's what we do. We all put it back into the show, try to make it better, try to make the experience for you, the listener, that much more improved. Um, and just as a final reminder, the good folks at Manscaped, our code will still work with that website. 20% off and free shipping with our code OUTLAP. That's O-U-T-L-A-P, all one word, to take advantage of their lovely line of product there. All right. So we've emerged from Japan. We've All the teams basically went back to base, and now they flew back out, I think, yesterday and today. Not a whole lot of big, epic F1 news is broken between now and then. We've had a lot of speculation as to where Carlos Sainz may go. Uh, We do know that Fernando Alonso has locked himself back in at Aston Martin. So that was kind of a big, I guess that was probably the biggest news in in the interim. Uh, He re-ups with a multi-year deal there. So that closes some doors on some 
some of the merry-go-round that's been going around with uh, respect to uh, this upcoming offseason, which is still going to be rather epic. But Fernando Alonso off the table. Cody, uh, initial uh, thoughts on Alonso re-upping with Aston? I got to say I'm a little disappointed that we didn't get some of like the uh, the far out there's of him signing at Red Bull instead of Perez or signing to that open seat at Mercedes for a year or two. Uh, I thought something like that would be a really awesome bit of a blockbuster move. But I got to say, I'm not really surprised. He's he did well there last year. He's continuing to do well there this year. Um there's a lot of investment going into the Aston Martin team uh, and their facilities. They're really trying to make a real move to, to become a front running team. And now that they're going to be having effectively a, a works deal with Honda going into the new engine regs, there's, there's a lot of room for, you know, some team to get it right. Some engine supplier to get it right with, with the new regulations and, you never know. We, we could see something happen where suddenly Aston Martin becomes the dominant car and uh, uh, Fernando Alonso would be there ready and waiting. So I, I figure that's how he's got to feel about it. Uh, any thought on the re- reuniting between one Fernando Alonso and Honda? Uh, we know that they have had some interesting history in the past. It's even affected Fernando Alonso's Indy 500 aspirations at one point in time. Uh, do you think it's all going to be kind of water under the bridge and we're all good? Or is there some sort of still uh, un- unreconciled ill will there? I don't think there's going to really be any ill will. I think uh, some some spokespeople from Honda have, have more or less come out and said that from their perspective, it's it's water under the bridge uh, by this point and that they're, they're happy to work with them again. Um, now, if he were to if Honda were to say produce a pretty cruddy engine at the start of the regs here and he starts shooting his mouth off again, then it'll, (laughs) it'll be over just like that. But I think, uh, yeah, so long as he doesn't say anything, uh, stupid, uh, I think they're, they're going to just let bygones be bygones and, uh, and form a, a nice, happy new partnership. Well, yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, I think the Honda thing is probably more than run its course. I know that there's new leadership at at Honda, so he's not dealing with the same, you know, people that he was necessarily before. Uh, And it shows that both can kind of be adults in the room at one point, you know, because Mm -hmm. that relationship had gotten so bad when, especially when he was with McLaren. I I hearken back to the, the Japanese Grand Prix where he, you know, famously called it the GP2 engine. And I remember watching him, you know, he's holding the throttle wide open and cars are passing him on the outside. So I get the frustration. Uh, those were some very interesting times as both an F1 fan and an F1 observer. But uh, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is Fernando Alonso, I think even, I think he'll be what, 46 by the time this deal yeah. ends. Um, he's still got it. And I've been saying that this is, he's an aberration. He's not the norm. You generally don't continue to be fast as you get older, but you know, he's still got it. He's obviously committed to Aston Martin. So it's going to be really interesting to see what they build. You know, there's no real talk about the other driver at Aston Martin and how that affects things or not. I guess we'll just kind of see what happens when that comes due. (laughs) Uh, But you know, that is a big, piece of the merry-go-round off the table. So take Aston Martin off your, your list. If you're Carlos signs, take Aston Martin off your list. If you were, you know, any of the other big free agents that might've looked to improve their, their lots, Alex Albon, maybe might, that might've worked. Um, but you know, we'll oversee kind of how that goes. So looks like Aston Martin, they're, like you said, they're building for the future. They've got a lot of investment. Lawrence Stroll is not in this to finish fifth. Uh, I don't think he's going to be happy with that finishing position for very long. So, you know, we'll have to see. And if you're an Aston fan, you know, it's time to, it's time to start getting excited. Your team has obviously got some really good things to it. They've done some big investments. Big things might be on uh, the calendar for you guys. And uh, speaking on the calendar, uh, we did get a confirmed 2025 calendar. Uh, a few changes, some some good stuff here. A few triple headers, which make me a little bit nervous, just as 
both a uh, a fan and a cover of the events uh, because we're going to have some work. But uh, the big headline, the Australian Grand Prix back in Melbourne, they will start the season. Uh, Bahrain actually moves all the way to round four. So even if we go necessarily testing, there'll be some difference between when we test and when we race. I think that is an obvious win. I think that actually hurts the first race of the year when you've got all this data from testing and you wait a week and then you go run the race there. What are you learning? How different could that track possibly be? Uh, at least with some weather, sandstorms, whatever, it may you may have to reacclimate at least to the track. Um, you know, I think the the U.S. round in Austin, I think it moves up a weekend. It usually is eh, it's right around the same time of the year, but I think it's just kind of where it hits on the calendar. Um, Qatar moved back uh, back into late November, so. You know, they were they're going to have a round earlier this year that moves way back um, a couple of, you know, let's see, you know, Singapore's kind of where it was Mexico kind of where it is still the Saturday race in Las Vegas. No real change there. Abu Dhabi still ending the season, um, but uh, a lot of flyaways early settling in for the European season and then lots of flyaways late. So, Cody, big thoughts on the calendar. I do really like that uh, Australia is the first round of the season again. It just kind of seems right. Um, you know, maybe someday we'll get Brazil back as being the uh, the final round again. Although I, you know, actually don't particularly mind Abu Dhabi being the last round because it is uh, pretty cool to see them do the last race at night with all the fireworks and everything that they do. Um you know, you were. I definitely wouldn't be the first person to complain that, uh, it, you know, the way that they do the calendar is a little strange in that uh, they don't group everything by region. Um, you know, uh, Formula One touts so much with their cars about that they're trying to, to move into the future and, and save on emissions and stuff like that. But, you know, moving the teams around uh, from one end of the planet to the other is, is really going to be where you're going to save uh, those types of emissions. So I... I hope that maybe someday in the future uh, they'll, they'll really group everything by region and, and really put their uh, their money where their mouth is on, on such things. Uh, the only thing that I don't really like about the calendar other than that, though, right now is I don't really like the big uh, time gaps. There's there's always been, you know, a big, you know, three to four week summer break, but we've almost pretty much got two of them because I think we've got three weeks between uh, the uh, British Grand Prix and the Belgian Grand Prix. And then you have Belgium and Hungary back to back or um, yeah, back to back. And then you have another, what is that? A three or four week break from Hungary to uh, the Netherlands. So it does feel a little weird uh, in the middle of the summer there where you got uh, one significant break, and then you get a little taste of Formula One coming back for two races, and then you got another significant break. Um, but, I mean, I'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there's definitely some logistical inconsistencies, I would say. I don't know, you know, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia makes sense, but then you're going from Saudi Arabia to Miami back to Italy, and then to Monaco. Yeah. Um Okay, that's still weird. And then you go to Monaco and Spain, and then you go, and then you go Canada, back to Canada. Like Austria. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you still have that kind of oddity. Um, so, you know, it, it, it looks like there's steps in the right direction. I, I am, like like you, I'm very happy to see Melbourne be the first race of the season. It just seems to set, you know, the crowd, the energy, the eternal hope that comes with race one. The fact that it's not where you're testing, I think, will help out a lot with that. Um, especially, you know, given, you know, car development and where everybody might be by the end of this season, you know, we'll have to kind of see how spicy the, the show really is. You know, this will be the last year before reg change. Last year's before reg changes tend to give you some interesting challengers. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, uh, you know, we still do have the 24 races, so that's something to definitely, uh, consider. Um, is that really kind of the upper limit? Uh, it seems from most of the teams that that seems to be kind of where we are. I don't feel the need to have very many more other than that, or at least if we're going to, if we're going to swap some, some other venue in, probably something else should drop off um, because I don't think yeah. you can really have logistically that's, I mean, you're talking from March to December, 
that's a lot for those for the for the traveling circus to the people who support the traveling circuits for all the families that are affected by all the people who are doing all the traveling yeah it's a lot to handle so uh i i can get that critique there all right, so I guess my, my next point in here is, are you ready for Active Arrow? Because speaking of that reg change, uh, they've tried to do some simulations involved with the 2026 regs, and it seems like the first blush, they didn't go so well. Uh, they, the driver's feedback was that the cars were very hard to drive. They were very much on the knife edge. We've kind of seen this before with proposed regs until you know you actually let the engineers really go at them try to see and you know like we saw even with this last rings we saw this unexpected bouncing that we never expected in any simulation but these are the simulations that are revealing the trouble so uh what what they've proposed what may happen is we may see like a drs or drs equivalent happen on both the front and the rear wings to control the downforce levels both leading up to and then through a corner that, of course, means that those elements all have to work and work in unison and work exactly when you expect them to, because if they don't, you end up with cars basically going for a spin on their own out of no error of the driver whatsoever. So I guess my question is, is this a lot of fear mongering over these new regs or do you think we've got a legitimate concern that's something we've got to try to tackle? I do think that they are legitimate concerns. From what I'm hearing, and hopefully hopefully I'm not getting the details of this mixed up too badly, but from what I've been hearing, they were going to be doing active arrow on the rear wings, and they were finding that in the, the lowest drag, you know, settings for that, that the, like you were saying, the car was becoming very unstable, very difficult to drive, um, very easy to, to lose control. And so they're kind of going back to the dry, drawing board and, and exploring how they can make that active air work, whether they need to do it on the front wing as well. And yeah, in which case you would, you would be able to control the arrow throughout the whole car. Um, there's also the same issue of safety with that, that we've, we've heard about from, you know, the, uh, the early days of ground effect or the days when they were doing um, uh, active suspension uh, to you know, position the car perfectly for for all the turns and straights and stuff like that is what happens if if you're doing active arrow. What happens if it fails? Um, does the car then you know lose control very suddenly and you're in for a very rough crash? Um, I do think those are all uh, legitimate concerns, and you know, I don't. I, I would think at this point in the process is still kind of you know early to be to be fear mongering. Um, I was kind of wondering your opinion on, do you think uh, if they're having troubles finding solutions to the issues they're seeing, do you see the arrow rules getting pushed back a year and we only see the new engines in 2026? Or do you think they're going to make a, a real push to, to keep everything on track for coming in on the same year? I'd like to think that they're going to really push to try to get this through. Um, the engines, while they are making some significant changes and I don't know how well you're going to do throwing that new engine into these cars. Um, mm. You would probably see, I would bet lap times because these cars are so heavy and you're taking away a good part of the electrical energy that these cars can generate four to five seconds a lap slower versus what you probably Ooh. have now. And not to mention then you would have to get all the teams to buy in to do a one year, you know, kind of a B spec car on everything that they have to marry an engine, not to mention then you have new engine makers coming in to force like the domino effect that this could have is pretty massive. If this, they can't solve this, um, mm. what you might end up seeing, which is again, you know, that, now you're going into your, what, what are your contingency scenarios here? Well, one, you could push everything back another year if it really was that bad. You could tell all your new OEMs it's not going to be 26, it's going to be 27. You convince your OEMs right now, hey, just push the current power units that are frozen out one more year. Maybe F1 has to, maybe Liberty has to come up with some extra cash, some incentives to do that. Everybody runs 2026 with what we have now. Maybe we get a repeat of 25, maybe it's better. 
That's one scenario. The other scenario is I can't, like I said, I can't see where you would try to marry the 2026 engine with these cars, with the current spec of cars. The other scenario that you might end up doing is we just kind of push through and deal. And maybe then if, if they can't solve it quicker, like I think they've already tried to say, you can't start work on your 2026 car until next year. Well, what if they move that deadline up six months and you let everybody then go at it um, maybe six months earlier than what was expected? That could be another scenario that they may end up having to do. Now, obviously, all of that's going to take massive rule meeting of the World Motorsport Council, and the FIA is going to have to sign off on that, and Liberty is going to have to sign off on that, and all these new OEMs are going to have to sign off on all that. So there's a lot of moving pieces. The best solution is they get this thing right sooner rather than later, uh, and then everybody can sleep a lot better. But, yeah, I mean, 2026 is a big deadline. The good news is we've got it over a year and a half before we get there. But uh, yeah, this is, this is, um, I I'm with you. I think this is legit concern. It's interesting that the simulations had it, you know, when we went from the, the V10 or the V8 aspirated engines to the hybrids, I remember those first couple races and we had cars literally not being able to make the grid. Uh, we cannot have a repeat of that. That will absolutely kill the sport. You can't get all the buzz of a Melbourne now being back in the, you know, the pole position in terms of the season, have these new regs and have a race with 12 cars. That doesn't work. That's bad for business. It's bad for everybody. It's a terrible look. Um, and then, you know, everybody who wants to go back to, you know, myself included, a simple, easy to work, aspirated, loud, visceral engine will be out in force saying that as I definitely would be. So, um, but you know, the, like I said, the best answer is hopefully that they're seeing what the problems are. They're going to take steps to mitigate. These are the smartest engineers on the planet. There's a good reason why you have to be pretty smart to work in formula one. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope we get there, but it's concerning. I'm, I'm a little concerned when I read this. That's for sure. All right. Yeah, well, they got oh. they got till the end of the year to, to figure them out. <laughs> so, and then then everyone's got to start working on it. So they got to seal it in by then. Yeah, and, and if, like I said, you know, if if they start moving it up, or even then they let it go three months early, that's telling me that they haven't been able to, a, on a macro level, solve it. Much less try to get down to a micro level of what each team would try mm -hmm. to do with their with their cars and their programs. So. But, uh, yeah, we will follow this for sure, and we will uh, report on what we know when we know it. Um, all right, so zooming in on this weekend, we have our first actual sprint race and first sprint format of the season. Just to kind of bring everybody up to speed, we have our new semi-revamped format as to what we have. Uh, it will start with free practice one that will go the same one hour that it always has. Instead of qualifying for the Grand Prix on a Friday or Saturday, depending on what time zone you're in, because we're in that weird part of the calendar yet again, um, the sprint qualifying will follow FP1. It'll be your traditional knockout format uh, that we've always had. So there's no change to the qualifying mechanisms or any of that. Um, but it is going to be the same sprint qualifying timing. So Q1, 12 minutes, Q2, 10, Q3, 8. So... And I think, I still do think that it's the mandatory soft sets of tires for the sprint qualifying um, that you have to use. But uh, we'll confirm that as we go throughout the course of the weekend. But I'm pretty sure that's the case. Uh, the sprint itself will follow the sprint qualifying will be the opening action that you'll see on Saturday a.m. local time at the track. Uh, and that'll be the 30% race distance points to the top eight. That is unchanged. Um, starting with eight points for first place, all the way down to one point for P8, uh, and no additional fastest lap points or anything like that. So uh, that's what you get if you can place in the top eight in the sprint. Uh, then you actually, then the cars will come out of Park for May. You can then make changes to your car setup if you've learned anything in the sprint, just as you would if you had your long run in FP2. So then... Later on on Saturday, Saturday afternoon session will be the traditional Grand Prix qualifying. That goes back to the same format that we've always known. Same traditional Grand Prix qualifying timings. Q1, 18 minutes. Q2, 15. Q3, uh, 12. 
And then uh, Sunday, the traditional race ran with the grid set by the Grand Prix qualifying event Saturday afternoon. Uh, Cody, is this better or worse in terms of the overall sprint weekend and what you saw? We got to see it one live in person. Uh, what do you think this tweak is going to do? Uh, I think it's I think it's going to be good. I think the the doing uh, practice and then all of the sprint stuff. And then all of the regular Grand Prix stuff, um, I, I think is is a good format. Um, I've been kind of wishy washy on my opinion of sprint races overall, um, but I do got to say, having seen one uh, last year, it definitely does uh, add some uh, spice to the weekend when you're there. Uh, you know, even if uh, it's not the most exciting sprint, which uh, you know our our sprint that we saw. Um, you know, probably watching on TV uh, wasn't particularly exciting, but I love being there for it. <laughs> um, the, I think, uh, yeah, I think the format is is pretty good. I think doing the first sprint this year in China is a little bit of a an odd decision because you figure we haven't raced at the circuit since 2019. Um, there's a bunch of drivers on the grid who haven't raced on this circuit ever. Uh, in Formula One, and it's, you know, a different uh, formula of cars from the last time that we raced in China. So a uh, little bit of an, an odd decision. I think, uh, if anything, it'll be a, a little unpredictable, uh, which, you know, is always good in Formula One. Um, but we'll just uh, we'll just have to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting that, you know, you come back to a venue that you haven't been to and then you give them the sprint weekend. Uh, it's kind of what we did when we brought Imola back. We kind of did the same type of thing. And that weekend actually turned out to be pretty entertaining from both a qualifying and even an overall race standpoint. So um, that's kind of what I think the hope is, is that we have good shows across the board. Um, there is something cool to watching the cars form on the grid and come out of the pits and do the warm up and do the recon laps and get, you know, all that ready to go, even if it's not really for the full Grand Prix. And then you get to see it again for real with more people on the grid and more pomp and circumstance mm -hmm. going on in the background. But, you know, I mean, as a spectator there, it's, it's a weekend you can't really afford to miss a session because it's everything is very important. On TV, sometimes it doesn't necessarily translate, but, you know, the fact of the matter is you, you put people in a race car, even if you tell them, for the love of God, don't wreck the car, uh, look at what happened at Williams. That that didn't seem to matter, now did it? You know, drivers are still going to push. They're still going to be race car drivers. You're still going to see, I think, uh, for, certain, for certain drivers in certain positions, the sprint have more meaning than for others. Um, whether or not, you know, the, the race at the front is going to be compelling or not. And the sprint, we'll have to see. Um, I just watched uh, this past weekend MotoGP at Coda. You know, we talked about Liberty acquiring MotoGP. Uh, the actual traditional race and the sprint were both really, really good. So if you get a good venue and you get the right formula of car, bike, whatever, you're going to have compelling story. You're going to have compelling uh, t television, regardless of the length of the race. And, and believe it or not, the, the longer format actually was more dramatic than the sprint one was. So, you know, you know that can happen as well. So, um, yeah, interesting to see. I, I'm also always willing to give a new format a shot. I think this is – it's a good tweak. It's a tweak in the right direction. The weekend builds a lot more naturally this way. You don't have – that kind of, all right, you're so into it on Friday, and then you just put all that to the side and do the Saturday <laughs> thing and then have that and then try to pick up where you were again from Friday. All right, where, where were we? All right, we were P4 here, but I watched them qualify P6 today, so then they're back to P4. So everything's cool now, right? You know, that's that's confusing, both as a spectator and and an observer. So, uh, But, yeah, I, I think it's a good step in the right direction. Let's see how it works. All right, so we are actually going to take a quick break. I'm just looking at the clock and the timings of it. So we're going to take our break here. We'll come back. We'll get into uh, the Shanghai Audi International Circuit Track Facts in just a little bit. Uh, we'll preview the weather, which could be part of the uh, overall story of the weekend. We'll talk about this track that we haven't been to since 2019. 
Uh, and then we'll get into our predictions. And Sir Cody, you are just dominating these predictions, man. You are you are locked in. <laughs> you are max for Stappen level of concentration. But we have a place we haven't been to in a while. So let's see how bad our lap times are this time. Uh, but we'll get into all that in just a little bit. So uh, you won't want to miss it. Come on back. You are listening to the Outlap F1 podcast. And we'll be right back after this quick pit stop. <laughs> Grab your flu powder, broomstick, or apparate to your favorite audio streaming service to join the discussion on Hogwarts, a podcast, where Dan and his friends have in-depth chapter-by-chapter breakdowns of each Harry Potter novel. Join the group as they dive into the magical world and discuss plot points, analyze character development, and occasionally go off the rails. Whether you're a muggle who's new to the series or a pure-blood wizard, who won't need a remember all Hogwarts a podcast brings everyone to the great hall for a magical discussion Hogwarts a podcast available wherever you get your podcasts all right welcome back this is season six this is episode 11 of the outlap f1 podcast it's our 2024 Chinese GP race preview show uh, you've got Andy and I'm along with Cody tonight and we just kind of recap the news and we're about to hop into our Grand Prix weekend proper First time going back to the Chinese circuit since 2019. Uh, but before we do that, you probably, if you were listening on the podcast, you probably just heard my read for the Hogwarts podcast. I want to send out a special congrats to my buddy, Mr. Daniel, the head uh, host on that podcast. He won his poker tournament tonight. You've probably, if you've been a longtime listener, you know, we, we dabble at poker. Uh, the two of us do. Not as much as Dan does. But, uh, Dan, I tip my hat, sir, uh, on your victory in your poker tournament tonight on the FPN Free Poker Network tournament. I will look forward to the Facebook post, and I shall like as I am apt to do. And it also means that I just don't have to get that much better at playing poker, and we both do. (laughs) All right. Uh, enough poker talk. That's a whole different podcast. We'll, we'll start that up at some point, too. Um, but uh, uh, we'll hop into our Chinese G- GP track facts. They're brought to us by the good folks at Pirelli Motorsports. So, Cody, tell us about the Shanghai Audi International Circuit. All right. This weekend, we're going racing at the Shanghai Audi International Circuit, located in, I'm going to try my best on the pronunciation here, Jieding, Jieding District in Shanghai, China. The uh, number of laps for the Grand Prix is 56. Uh, track length around this circuit is 5.451 kilometers, or 3.387 miles, and it consists of 16 turns. Uh, Pirelli's tire selection for the race is going to be the C2 for hard, C3 for medium, and C4 uh, compound for soft. Uh, and their track characteristics are a 3 out of 5 for traction, 2 out of 5 for asphalt grip, 4 out of 5 for asphalt abrasion, 5 out of 5 for track evolution, uh, 4 out of 5 for tire stress, 4 out of 5 for braking, 4 out of 5 for lateral load, and a 3 out of 5 for downforce. The qualifying lap record uh, around the circuit goes to Sebastian Vettel uh, set when he was still racing for Ferrari in 2019, and that was set with a uh, 1 minute 27.064 seconds, uh, while the race lap record was set way back in 2004 by Michael Schumacher uh, with a 1 minute uh, 32.238 seconds. Uh, most wins around the circuit goes to Lewis Hamilton with a whopping 6 wins here. Uh, and while second place is way back, it's a tie between Fernando Alonso and Nico Rosberg, each with two wins apiece. Uh, most constructor wins around this circuit is uh, Mercedes, so I'm um, imagining a lot of those uh, Lewis Hamilton victories contributing to uh, the six for Mercedes, but I know there's Nico Rosberg in there somewhere. Uh, followed by four for Ferrari in second, three for McLaren in third, and two wins here for Rednick's fourth place. What's the circuit like? All right. This circuit's pleasing form when seen from the air. It's designed to look like the Chinese symbol for Shang, meaning upwards, is equally pleasing to the drivers on terra firma. There's a unique start to the lap as the drivers fly into the ever-tightening turns one and two before they dart left through three and four. 
the high, super high G force turns seven and eight are beloved by the drivers. Well, the circuit also features one of the longest straights on the calendar, the 1.2 kilometer stretch that separates turn 13 and 14. I actually think the only long, uh, back stretch that's longer is actually Toda. Uh, the current weather forecast and the weather might play a factor this weekend. So Friday for uh, the practice and the sprint qualifying, overcast high near 70. Winds out of the southeast at 10 to 20, a 24% chance of rain. Lots of rain expected overnights these days uh, in between all the sessions. So even though I'm not talking about a lot of rain during the day, track might be wet at certain points. So uh, on Saturday, considerable cloudiness, high around 75. Winds now out of the west, so completely different direction. 10 to 20 again, a 24% chance of rain. And for the race on Sunday, <clears throat> cloudy. High of near 68. Winds different direction again, so this could be very wind effective as well. Winds out of the north this time, 5 to 10 miles per hour. Again, a 24% chance of rain. All right. Yeah, so we have not been to this track in a while. I forgot the, the fun of the turn one. Apparently, it's 270 degrees. It's almost a full 360. Um, there's a very nice, tight, twisty sector two, which is going to probably uh, separate some cards. The very long stretch, you're coming out of a slow speed corner, turns 12 and 13, and then you're hitting it all the way into another almost hairpin, almost Bahrain like turn one into turn 14 before mm -hmm. the final um, little chicane uh, up to the finish. So, uh, going to be a very interesting setup, I would imagine, for most teams uh, trying to, to merge between the high speed and, and the slow speed. Yeah, I've uh, I've heard drivers describe uh, that first, you know, uh, turn one, turn two, uh, as being a very interesting and uh, a difficult turn because uh, the radius of that turn changes as you keep going into it. It gets uh, uh, it starts out as like a like a looser right hander, and then uh, when it gets into turn two, there it gets much tighter. Uh, still going in the same direction though, uh, so that it's a little bit of a, a weird one. Uh, kind of a unique turn for uh, for Formula yeah, One. Yeah, definitely. It is uh, definitely a unique circuit, and it's good to be going back here. It's usually always very well attended. Uh, and then even if there is weather, um, there's there's a sky bridge right, right above the start-finish straight, or right above the start-finish line uh, that can sometimes change literally the amount of grip between wet and dry and then wet again. So if we get weather, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays into it. And then yep. that sometimes actually... It's, it's like um, going under a bridge. Sometimes even when the rain stops, it's still dripping. So, you know, that could also play into it as well. So <laughs> we'll have to see kind of how this all plays out over the course of this weekend. All right. So now we will uh, hop into our Choose Your Champion predictions game. Uh, Cody, I'm just going to go ahead and, and play this for you. Because uh, you have been dominating this over the last couple of weekends. Uh, really some great job, actually, with the predictions. We're probably doing better than I think we ever kind of have as a show. But this is a unique challenge. This is a track we haven't been to, which usually means it's going to be a disaster for us in terms of lap time. So let's see what happens this weekend. So we will start, as we're apt to do, with our qualifying pole sitter. Uh, I'm going to go straight chalk. It's Max Verstappen's world, and we're all just living in it until somebody takes it away from him. Charles Leclerc might get close, but I don't see it happening. I got Max on the pole. Cody, what you got? Since he's set the pole for, for everything so far this year, uh, I, I got to go with Max Verstappen, too. I switched it up for one race, went with Leclerc, and it didn't happen. So, you know, I'm going to just probably keep guessing match, uh, Max for the pole until someone else gets it, and I'm wrong. All right, very good. We'll lock those in. Uh, so our qualifying pole lap time is actually all the way from 2019. That was set by Lewis Hamilton with a 131.547. Uh, so, Cody, what you got for lap time? This will be this should be interesting. Yeah, and like we were saying for our recent predictions, too, I've been pretty proud of our, uh, our lap time predictions recently. We've been actually uh, pretty close to the mark, but, yeah, this one, different regs a bunch of years ago. It's going to be a little bit of a tough one so i'm going a little slower than the 2019 time i'm gonna go with uh uh max verstappen setting that pole lap with a one minute 32.003 all right very good we'll lock that in 
Um, I'm going to go a tad faster. Uh, I do think that these cars are a bit quicker uh, than the, their 2019 counterparts. Uh, so I'm going to go with a 130.817. I don't think we're going to come close to the Vettel record just because we haven't been here in so long. Um, but uh, I do think we're going to be a tad quicker than we were in 2019. So I got 130.817. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, for our race podium on Sunday, the 2019 race podium featured Lewis Hamilton taking the win, Valtteri Bottas in the Mercedes 1-2, and Sebastian Vettel for Ferrari coming home in P3. Uh, so, Cody, I don't know that that's very predictive of anything for this year, considering most nope. of those guys are in different places now, uh, except for Mr. Hamilton, but uh, and he'll be moving on next year. So what do you got for your podium? Uh, my podium is is going to sound a little boring. Uh, I'm going with Max Verstappen coming home with the win. Shocker there. Uh, Sergio Perez bringing home P2. And then uh, Carlos Sainz coming in P3. You know, I keep I keep selling him short. I keep going with Leclerc to uh, wrap up the podium, and it just hasn't happened yet. So I'm going to go with Sainz this time. All right. Very good. Uh, I do tend to agree with you on a lot of this. Uh, we are four for four for team one twos, uh, in 2024. I don't suspect that that's going, I do suspect that that will actually continue, uh, just simply because the Red Bull is so nice on its tires. Doesn't seem to matter what type of corner it is. This track has them all, uh, but the slow speed, I'm taking a lot of Bahrain. I'm taking a lot of Red Bull here. Max Verstappen to take the win. Sergio Perez to come in in P2. I will go different from you, and I will say Charles Leclerc will come home. The Ferrari clearly the second fastest car right now. Um, not that I don't like Carlos Sainz. I do. I love the fact that he's spurning it all to everybody while he doesn't have a drive. Somebody sign him. I'm going to keep <laughs> pushing that until it happens. Dang it. But anyway, uh, but here I've got Charles Leclerc coming home in the bronze medal position on P3 on the podium. All right. So our fastest lap in the driver. This one should be interesting. So, Cody, what do you have here? I've actually got Charles Leclerc getting the fastest lap here. I think he's going to be missing out on that podium, and therefore he's going to be uh, pushing for that extra fastest lap point. Maybe he'll be in a pretty good gap uh, between, you know, say fourth and fifth uh, to be able to do that and push for that. So I got Charles Leclerc doing the fastest lap with a, a one minute 33.147. All right, very good. Uh, I'm going to have Max Verstappen. It's probably going to be one of those, even if it's a two- or three-stop race, uh, it comes out on that set of hard tires and just blitzes it near the end. As the fuel load goes down, that tends to be what he does. Uh, I do have your lap. I have the lap time a bit quicker than you. I've got a 132.584. All right. Uh, So for our bonus picks this week, we selected P6, P7, P8. Interesting positions here given the fight in the midfield given what some of the characters some of the cars in that midfield or or the upper midfield um because really the midfield is p10 to p12 but uh anyway what do you got for bonus picks cody what do you got for p6 7 and 8 so when we do these kind of like higher up bonus picks i always kind of have to think about like what are the guys that are going to be in between uh the podium and these spots and for this one I'm actually not really sure what I'm doing because I figured Leclerc is in fourth, but I don't think I really thought through who was going to be in fifth. Maybe Hamilton. So uh, sixth place, I've got Norris uh, as the probably the the higher performing of the McLarens. Seventh, I've got uh, George Russell, and then eighth, I've got Fernando Alonso. All right, very good. Uh, so I'm going to go with George Russell in P6. Uh, I think it's going to be one of those Mercedes, th- that Mercedes McLaren Aston blob. I think you're going to see some different shifting here. I think this is going to favor a bit of the Mercedes. I think it's going to favor a bit of the Astons. I don't see McLaren. They've already put an article out that said we're going to focus on kind of damage limitation. There's a lot of slow speed here. Just looking at the topography of that track, I see a lot of the same types of curves in Bahrain that doesn't necessarily suit the McLaren car. I love the fact you're wearing the hat, but I don't think they're going to do real well this weekend. Uh, So I've got George Russell getting the better of him in P6. I've got Lando Norris coming home in P7 and Oscar Piastri coming home in P8. So I still think they'll get double points. Uh, so long as they don't do anything really, really dumb or, or, or end up in a kerfuffle somewhere. But uh, 
yeah, I don't think they're going to shine real well like they they could have or would have in Japan. All right, so uh, we're going to actually do two uh, prop bets this weekend. One will be uh, nationality related because we have a Chinese driver on the grid. That would be Grand Yu Zhou. And we're not going to put him to the pressure of making points. Uh, he hasn't really been close very much to making points this year. Kick Sauber, especially with that whole pit stop thing. So we're going to take that off the table. All he's got to do is put it together for one lap. So does Team China, does Zhao Grand Yu, somehow, with the support of all the fans in front of him, uh, make Q3? So Cody, what's your thought? I think it would be really cool if he did. Because this is, despite having been in Formula One for a couple of years now, this is his first home Grand Prix, which has got to be something special. Um, but sadly, that uh, Kick Sauber car just doesn't look like it's it's able to compete well enough to uh, to make a time into the top ten. So sadly, I'm gonna I'm gonna say no. I don't think he's gonna make it into Q3. All right, very good. Uh, I will actually have to concur with you. I, I would love to see the extra like half second of lap time that your home crowd is supposed to give you. Uh, shine on him. I like Zhao a lot, actually, as a driver. I think he's actually, I've seen some interviews with him. I actually think he's got a, a really good personality that they, they just don't expose us to enough. Um, but I, I think he's got some uh, sarcasm to him, which I think is actually pretty funny. But uh, anyway, uh, but I don't think with Kick Sauber, where they are in their car development, I don't think it's enough to make Q3 here uh, in either the sprint or main qualifying. So unfortunately, I have to give this a no as well. And speaking of said sprint race, since it is our first sprint weekend of the season, uh, didn't put this in the document, but we'll just uh, record these now. Who do you got for your sprint podium? Oh, boy. Uh, I've got Max Verstappen taking the sprint win. Um, you know, I don't know if I don't know if Perez is going to do quite as well in the sprint. So I'm going to say Verstappen P1, Sainz P2, and Leclerc P3. All right, very good. Um, I like your picks, but I got to go a little bit different just because we got to have some variation here. But I do think this is Max World and we're all living in it. So I will give him the win. Uh, I really like your Carlos Sainz in P2, but I'll give Charles Leclerc P2 and I'll uh, slip the Ferraris around. I think Carlos Sainz will come home in P3. Uh, just screams like one of these tracks that Sergio Perez doesn't get right the first time. He'll probably get it right in the real Grand Prix qualifying, and that's how he'll get back to P2. But uh, mm -hmm. probably, I think, on, with not a lot of practice, I think that's a tough ask for him, uh, considering this is, like I said, a track that they haven't been to in a long time. All right, so we will lock these in. We'll see uh, if I've rallied at all or if you continue to dominate, sir. So uh, <laughs> good luck to you this weekend. Uh, yeah, good luck to me as well, I guess. So we'll, we'll, we'll see <laughs> yeah. kind of how this all plays out. Um, but good anyway. Luck to everyone. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, before we hop on out uh, for the night, uh, we're going to kind of recap when and where to watch your F1 this weekend because it's kind of weird timings. It's kind of like a Japan weekend except later. Uh, yeah. So FP1 kicks off Thursday evening if you're in the United States, 11.25 p.m. Eastern. That is on ESPNU. Uh, the sprint qualifying will be Friday, 3.25 a.m. Eastern, so uh, up by the dawn's early, early light if you are so inclined. That'll be on ESPN2. The sprint itself, actually, this is decent time uh, for you to catch the sprint, so you don't necessarily have to do a whole lot here. You just got to stay up a little bit late. 10.55 p.m. Eastern. I think that's actually really interesting uh, They have the sprint be on kind of almost in prime time in the U.S. So 10.55 p.m. Eastern, that's ESPNU. Uh, the traditional Grand Prix qualifying will take place later on in uh, the Saturday morning, 2.55 a.m. Eastern. That's on ESPN2. The pre-race kicks off 2 a.m. Eastern. That's on Big ESPN. And the race itself will kick off 3 a.m. Eastern, also on Big ESPN as well. Uh, also, F1 TV is a perfectly good alternative if you don't have ESPN. Uh, they also are streaming on the ESPN Plus platform, so if you... Uh, have a subscription to either F1 TV or ESPN Plus. You can catch all of the sessions as well. All right. So I guess that'll do it for our Chinese Grand Prix preview. We will be back on Sunday to recap all of the action uh, by the dawn's early light. I don't know how much of this we're going to be able to do live 
I might not be able to make live tweeting for qualifying. Uh, if I happen to be up, I'll do it. If not, I'm not making any promises. Uh, this this yeah. timeline is very, very, very tough. Uh, so we may just do this the old on-demand bit. But anyway, uh, Cody, any final thoughts before we head into the weekend? Just that watching any sporting event live is is magical and preferred over uh, watching uh, a recording. That said... Uh, 2 a.m. our time for me. Ugh, that's a tough ask, man. I might be watching that one <laughs> Sunday morning. Yeah, so we'll have to see. But anyway, we'll be back Sunday, more than likely in the evening, to recap uh, all the good, the bad, and the ugly of this race weekend. Uh, we also have a bit of an announcement to make. We are working on something potentially very special. Can't give a whole lot of details yet, but we've been in some advanced discussions to bring you some interesting new content over the course of the next couple of weeks. We're hoping to kind of just finalize and line up on timings. We both, both sides of this thing have agreed we will both want to do it. It's just a question of scheduling and timing and all that. So stay tuned to that. I can't get into how much more until I get it all locked down. The second I do, I will reveal all. So stay tuned to our social media over the course of the weekend. If something breaks and we're able to get this across the finish line, I will share all the details as soon as I can. Uh, it's going to be something really fun. It's something we haven't done we, we have not really done anything like this in the history of the show. So it's going to be something very interesting. I promise it will be a good listen, uh, and we will bring it to you as soon as humanly possible. But if, if anyway, if nothing happens, we'll give you still our traditional race recap review. We'll be back on Sunday night. Uh, until then, take care. And as always, may all your laps be fast. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Outlap F1 podcast. If you like what you heard, click that subscribe button and be sure to leave us a five-star review. If you want to connect with us outside of the show, check out our website at www.outlapf1.com. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Outlap F1 podcast or email us at chat now at outlapf1.com. As always, thank you so much for your support and we'll see you on the next one.